So the first case, um, a 69-year-old uh, classic presentation of renal cancer, decent performance status, nice Barbadian man who came through the uh, doors of guys, and he had a CT scan um, for uh, assessment. Um, there's a CT. Any thoughts on that, uh, Noel, just on um, first review, what uh, your recommendation would be and what your uh, surgical thoughts are on uh, looking at that CT scan? Well, not having seen the scan before, he has a large left-sided renal tumour um, and uh, two small lesions of indeterminate uh, origin in the liver. They're cysts. They're cysts, good. Uh, on ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Can we see his adrenal? We don't have a view of his adrenal. So just looking at that, um, we've got no other information. So he's 69, uh, otherwise good performance status. We don't know what the uh, systemic imaging is. We'd like to see that before reaching any mm, of further course. decisions. Um, would you like me to comment further without seeing that, or are you going to tell us yeah, more? Yeah, I think just maybe a couple of thoughts on these, um, these two plates, maybe. Well, um, obviously, looking at the, uh, the bottom left uh, corner plate, um, the, the tumour's in close proximity to the paraspinal musculature there, uh, probably not infiltrating on that view, but certainly compressing. On the view on the right, it looks rather more infiltrative. And uh, also, I uh, will be a little concerned about the... Uh, duodenum and pancreas, it will probably not be infiltrated, but uh, that region around the splenic veins, splenic arteries, it courses over the top, can be quite problematic, bearing in mind your comments in your talk, which is don't get bleeding early in an operation, and that's a spot you can get early bleeding from uh, intraoperatively. Okay, thanks very much. I think this is probably renal vein involvement uh, here, and we were certainly concerned about... Uh, uh, this, whether there was infiltration of the paraspinal muscles. But the decision was that this patient uh, should undergo uh, nephrectomy. And in fact, between uh, the booking of his operation and his operation, he came in with clot retention, and which further accelerated uh, a decision for surgery. Jim, um, I make a you may, of course you can. I would think this might be a sur time eligible patient or a clinical trial patient, so I would get medical oncology involved early on to see if he was trial eligible. Very helpful. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, that's the histology. Uh, unpleasant tumor. Uh, there was a widespread invasion outside the kidney. Uh, lymph nodes were clear, uh, but these had rhabdoid features. Um, the pathologists weren't sure whether I had a clear margin uh, on, the, um, uh, on the renal vein. And uh, he made a reasonable recovery, but he did have a small volume PE, five dose post-op, so he was, uh, had to go on to warfarin. Um, so a medonc, uh, maybe Tom. So a 69-year-old, performance status good, making a reasonable recovery from the surgery, but he's had a PE, and he's on warfarin. Um, where are you taking this one now? Does warfarin complicate matters? Uh, would you... Go with some uh, follow-on treatment in an adjuvant setting here? Or? You, well, one wouldn't give an adjuvant, um, um, any adjuvant tra treatment outside of a clinical trial. That's yeah. Um, the clinical trial that we're doing in the UK is um, SOURCE, which is Tim Eisen's study. Still Eisen's open. It's still open. It's recruiting well. It's a very, very important question. The question is... Um, um, the key question of placebo versus one year of therapy versus three years of therapy. Serafinib is a drug which um, is an important agent. It was developed at the same time as sunitinib. Um, Tim is recruiting in Canada, in Europe, and in the UK, and I think it's a really, really important trial. And is we one allowed to use TKIs in people on warfarin? You are allowed to use TKIs on people on warfarin. I don't use TKIs in patients on warfarin. I switched them to low molecular weight heparin. We've seen unpredictability of bleeding and issues surrounding there. So although in the license it doesn't specifically say it's contraindicated, I don't use warfarin in combination with TKIs. I use them low molecular weight heparin. Okay. Would that, would that mirror what you do, James? Yeah, I mean, I agree. You, you could do if you wanted to, but the thing is you're going to end up with someone who's got an INR of 7 at some stage, and then if you've gone on a drug already, which you might do, like a which predisposes to bleeding, then you've got a big problem. So I always convert to lymphocytes so, so as well. So some care yeah. with uh, care with the anticoagulation. Okay, that's uh, helpful. Anyway, because of the PE and he had some chest infection afterwards, it, it was difficult to assess his lungs. And radiologists hedged their bets about whether he did or didn't have pulmonary metastasis in the six to ten months after the surgery. And it's difficult, isn't it? The, 
It was just un we were unclear on whether he had pulmonary metastasis or not. They became gradually a bit more clear over time. But we just weren't sure whether this guy, he was clearly at high risk of it, we weren't sure whether he did or didn't have pulmonary metastasis. But eventually, 18 months after the uh, surgery, the feeling was that there was definitely evidence of small volume pulmonary metastasis and there was a paraortic node. His performance status by then had changed a bit. There's a little bit of extra medical history there. Uh, creatinine was good. So I think we've got clear, now 18 months on, we've got clear radiological evidence of recurrence um, in this man with, again, a reasonable performance status. And I think the question I would ask um, perhaps James is, would you recommend treatment for this man's asymptomatic metastases now? The honest answer is I try and avoid treating people if I can um, because some of this has been covered already. But the, the day you start treatment with the drugs is a massive change for the patient's life. They're coming up to hospital, they're having blood tests, they're having scans. And so, it, and it's palliative treatment, it's asymptomatic. Um, but the timing is very difficult. And there's actually very little um, work on this. We had a, um, actually with, with Simon, um, we had a little look at um, our experience in the TKI era, so-called, um, recently. And we were very surprised. I think there were 50 or 60 patients, which we, would, we had deliberately observed. And our median period of observation before we started treatment with sunitinib um, was over a year which we would like to think was a year of good quality of life yeah. and we started treatment in such a way that the disease, the, the chances of controlling the disease wasn't compromised. Yeah. So, personal view. I must say, it's something I've learned from doing a multidisciplinary kidney tumor clinic with Simon is that observation is often our first line treatment. The drugs are not our first line treatment, often observation is. A candidate for IL-2, 69 year old, performance status 1, PE. Um, you're really looking at 40-year-olds for the IL-2? I mean, age alone wouldn't exclude him, but he's not ideal on right. the other grounds, really. Okay, good. Okay. Um, and we've, we've been over the first-line treatment issues. Uh, if you were going to treat, I'm not going to uh, dwell on that again. Anyway, 18 months post-op, Mike Jewett, you're good at radiology. Um, what's, your, um, what's your key, uh, what's your key uh, finding on that uh, CT scan? Thank you very much for this question, Tim. <laughs> You've, a, life, a life in it's, it's urology, the, there's an amazing radiological feature. It's the chest. <laughs> very, very good. Very, very good. Can anyone see it? There's a metastasis in the right ventricle. And uh, the lungs, one's always looking at the lung fields, of course, but there's a lump in the right ventricle. And uh, what do you do about that? He's had a pulmonary embolus. He's got some low volume progression in the lungs, but he's got a lump in the heart. And of course, um, uh, there it is. Um, if you go back, of course, as, all, as with all radiology, it was always on the previous scans, and it was there before. It's grown a bit. But uh, I, I, don't worry, we, we haven't put this guy uh, forward uh, for for heart surgery, but that's basically the progression of that right ventricular metastasis. Um, and uh, he ticks along, but uh, it's intriguing, isn't it? And you, you kind of just worry that something big's going to happen to this guy uh, at uh, some point. I don't, would anyone recommend he have a coronary uh, cardiac intervention for that? Or anyone had any experience of intracardiac metastasis in this sort of situation? It's not an isolated case. We've got another patient like this. We, We've done one and they did okay from the heart and you, point of view. Yeah. Tim, was, and was that an isolated metastasis or was it? actually had other disease, but it was, it was hemodynamically compromising. Oh, well, so again, if the, if the patient had symptoms of hemodynamic compromise, go for it. How about you, Mike? Uh, Tim, I, when this man, when you showed us his post-op pathology, I would have advised him to go to his home parish in Barbados and visit his childhood friends. But now we're out, <laughs> we're out 18 months. So this man's behaving more like a clear cell, uh, not a sarcoma, sarcomatoid tumor. So I would actually start being a little more aggressive the longer it's taking for these things to evolve. And uh, we would certainly consider operating on him. And actually some of the less invasive technologies in cardiac yeah. Surgery now might be applicable here, I'd ask. 
Yes, I, I wasn't sure whether... I, I think we probably ought... To, I'm not actually sure. We've had an opinion. We've referred him. We've referred him. Very good. It's good to know. <laughs> when all else fails, take a history. Right. <laughs> so we, we have referred to, him. To Very Manchester. <laughs> I must have been away that day. Right, fine. Interesting, uh, interesting pattern of metastasis, though, isn't it? But I think one of the things I've learned about this disease is that, I mean, although this man is progressing slowly not on treatment, I think when some of these patients are held in check on treatment... We are getting some bizarre patterns of local recurrence and regional recurrence, which become quite difficult to manage. And uh, I think one starts to see tricky clinical management decisions in people who are being held in check on, uh, on these drugs. Uh, what did we do? We uh, started him on sunitinib eventually. Uh, he had an acute renal injury uh, uh, with a high creatinine, gamma GT all over the place. It was stopped and restarted at a lower dose, and his warfarin was stopped. So I think... It illustrates that uh, these, they're not smarties, are they, these drugs, and they can cause um, serious uh, problems uh, in initiating uh, treatment. Very good. Next case. Um, a 77-year-old lady who has referred uh, to me from Steve Garnett uh, in Eastbourne, and she'd presented with right-sided clock colic, hadn't felt right for about six months, and this was um, her CT and one of the most intimidating CTs I think I've ever faced. A delightful lady, quite compromised, very swollen legs, not moving at all well, domestically limited really with um, swollen lower half of her body. And um, I think uh, that's not a good CT, clearly. Uh, there's intracardiac uh, tumor and that uh, tumor behind the liver. Um, Mike. Um, what do you think about that one? So what, what I'm interpreting with the CTs you've showed us is that she's got relatively small right primary or we're not seeing the left kidney and it's Yeah, it's a right from, primary, but it's, yeah. we think it's in the adrenal, not the kidney. Uh, uh, the, the mass is, uh, uh, it's obviously difficult with not being able to show right. you the whole CT sequence, but the, the CT sequence here is of a, probably a right adrenal tumor with extension into the cava to the level of the heart, uh, 77, but compromised significantly clinically uh, by, by the disease. That would be fair, wouldn't it, Steve? Are you still here? Or? Is he still here? No, maybe not. Uh, so what, how about, uh, what do you think? Do you think we've reached the limits of what we can do uh, in these sort of patients? Well, the, the obvious things are where's the primary, and if there's an adrenal primary, that raises a whole new... Uh, issue and doesn't make things better. No, uh, quite. If we think of it as an RCC, uh, I think I'm seeing something in the heart there as well, perhaps, yeah. uh, in the right uh, atrium. Uh, so this is a level four lesion. And as you pointed out earlier, the expansion of the cava, the vascularization of the cava, it's involving probably the left hepatic veins and maybe the right, you'd have to do an MRI and maybe a transesophageal echo is very useful, which you didn't mention earlier, yeah. but we use a lot. So uh, I think the hardest thing in these patients is to know when not to operate. Um, and I also would defer to the medical oncologist to see whether they thought she was fit for treatment, thinking no. along the RCC line, and they probably wouldn't want no, to. No, what do you feel about this one? Do you, get, you presumably have a practice in this area? Well, I would concur with everything Mike has said. Firstly, uh, we'd like to see what the cell type is. I think if it's adrenal, then, and we certainly see adrenals going up the uh, IVC in this way. Um, I think in terms of um, imaging, we would, we'd need all of the imaging available to us. But I think key features here are, firstly, the, the technical features of, uh, from a surgical point of view of the radiology, and that is a very difficult uh, proposition, I think. The second thing is the patient's 77, mm. and so the problems associated with operative morbidity are much, much higher. Uh, not least also the loss of cerebral function in big operations in older pa patients. And you know, notably in your talk, you mentioned the patient who'd recovered uh, mentally very quickly after uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, but a lot of those patients can't do the Times crossword quite as quickly afterwards. And in that older group of patients, they do suffer significantly. So rounding it all up, I don't think we would want to be approaching this surgically. We want to be approaching this medically uh, with full discussion with our team. And one of those aspects of treatment is 
simply observation in this group, accepting that she's already symptomatic. Yeah, no, I would think that incredibly wise um, opinions, aren't they, those? I, not easy to treat these patients with drugs either, I think, with uh, compromised circulation, though, and her INR was um, uh, problematic because of hepatic venous status, uh, venous stasis. I, what I felt was that I had to be absolutely sure there was no obvious clinical sign of metastasis, and I felt that doing anything to this woman in the context of metastasis would not have been sensible at all, but I, d I did say in my talk that one has a circulatory problem which is severely compromising her, and one has an oncological problem which is also compromising her, and try, you, one needs to deal with both problems. Mike. Just one uh, minor thing. Whenever I see a caval thrombus, I start, I anticoagulate the patient in the clinic. I send them to the thrombosis clinic. I've had two patients die between my initial assessment and getting them worked up of, um, of that was benign some, embolus. Yeah, I, I must say that was one of the lessons Tim Christmas always taught in this disease, wasn't he? Uh, that uh, if these patients uh, came, they, one needed to rattle along and uh, get going. No. No, I, I would. Um, I mean, one of the other things which is not always clear is what, uh, how much of that thrombus is tumor and how much of it is, uh, uh, is, is clot. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the, it, this, was, this was difficult. I, I mean, I, clearly, I think one was absolutely at the limits of where one could possibly go with uh, uh, treatment. And what I, I have completely, I think my team would concur, had completely fair, open uh, conversation with this lady about uh, what may or may not happen. And I told her that the patients, the two patients who died in our series had both been over the age of 70, and this was right at the limits. Anyway, we did a right adrenalectomy and nephrectomy on bypass. She had an IVC replacement because it was expanded and it was infiltrating. You couldn't get this thrombus out of the cava. It took seven hours. And uh, as we often do with these cases, we packed her uh, uh, because there was a significant coagulopathy um, at the end. And she died eight hours post-op with an uncorrectable um, coagulopathy. Uh, we threw a lot, of, a lot of things at this lady's uh, coagulation and absolutely nothing happened. So I think uh, the wise men at the front probably um, got the decision right. I think it's difficult to know, isn't it, when you're, at the, when you're at the limits of what surgery can achieve, then I think sometimes you probably push too hard. And this was our third death in our series. No. Well, I think that uh, one thing that uh, it just brings up an issue with these patients and that a number of them have got liver dysfunction if they've got hepatic obstruction of the hepatic veins. So Bud Chiari is quite common in, in, mm. in the more extensive ones. And it may be that what you, you, you saw with your uncorrectable coagulopathy was a manifestation of the fact that she had a degree of liver failure before you started and mm. simply wasn't able to compensate when she was pushed over the threshold. Yeah. yeah. Tom? So one of the, uh, one of the pa this is one of the groups of patients that I get referred quite a lot about whether or not there's a role of neoadjuvant targeted therapy at this time point. And the case reports that are available and the data available suggest that there's no role for neoadjuvant therapy in any patients currently. Um, there are case reports of local progression in the IVC with sunicinib therapy. Um, and there are very few case reports of stunning responses from level four tumors making them suddenly operable. Um, in fact, there is some data to suggest it can make surgery more complicated, not more straightforward. So I'm not in the habit of giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy to these patients, although with this 77-year-old inoperable lady, the temptation is to try and go down that route. Yeah, very helpful. So, Tim, was it clear sarcoma? No, it was a carcinosarcoma <laughs> of the adrenal. And uh, I think... Uh, I think, again, I said in my talk that uh, there's been quite a lot of non-clear cell histologies in this series of intracardiac tumors, lyomyosarcomas and neuroectodermal tumors and translocation tumors. And I think uh, unusual histologies are quite common in this group. And uh, uh, that there may be, I suppose, a case for pre-op biopsy in all of them uh, because it does potentially alter what one might do with follow-on, doesn't it? Robert, you... Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure we got things right with her, but I did. I think she was properly looked after, and her husband wrote to me uh, um, a couple of weeks later and said how uh, impressed he'd been with the quality of care that she'd received. So I think we killed her, but. Uh, um, it was very economic. It's less than one hospital day. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Cheapest possible. Okay. Only, only the tough ones survived when they arrived in Newfoundland, didn't they? Right, so all those years ago. <laughs> the hard ones. God. So, um, uh, and there, uh, just, a, just a, f a final thought, maybe. Uh, uh, James, maybe a thought. 
TKI is used in situations of profound vascular obstruction. A reasonable option. I mean, Tom's uh, given a view on that, but maybe just a quick view on that. Um, I'm profound vascular obstruction. If, if the patient is fit enough um, and the organ system function is sufficient to tolerate the treatment and they don't have any other options, I would discuss it, yes. Okay. I wouldn't say no, but I'd discuss it with the patient. Very good. Very helpful. Right. 40-year-old uh, female, one of our favorite patients, uh, no comorbidities, two young children, in tears, in clinic, CT, loin pain. Uh, here's the CT. Um, have a look at that. Um, there's uh, obviously a right renal tumor, but it's more than just that. And uh, it's a right renal tumor, of course, with significant lymphadenopathy in the paracaval area and uh, pre-aortic area, best seen, I think, here. And really, this case is about whether one would go to cytoreductive nephrectomy. She's 40. She's got two children. There's the kidney mass. There are the lymph nodes. And uh, there's also that in her neck. Uh, she had some uh, supraclavicular lymph nodes. Amazing how often they are involved in cancer, isn't it? The left supraclavicular lymph nodes. Um, and uh, the question really uh, is, what would you recommend for this lady? Uh, moderate size right side of kidney tumor, outstandingly uh, good performance status, but quite tasty uh, lymphadenopathy. Mike, what would you uh, do for that? Is Tim Whittleston still here? Whenever I see younger women, I, particularly women, but younger patients, I would be thinking this could possibly be metastatic from another organ. So you haven't shown us her pelvis, her ovaries, her they were, they were uh, gut, fine. and uh, okay, so forth. Good point. Okay. So, would you biopsy here? Yeah, and that's you would always point. biopsy here. Would I, everyone on front row biopsy uh, here before recommending side reductive or? Absolutely routine, get a biopsy. I mean, sir time, it, it is an entry requirement, as you will know when you get it up and going. So we've actually, because it's been mandated in clinical trials, we've come to think we should do it more, yeah. not less. Okay. We, we, didn't, uh, we didn't feel that that lady's kidney could come out, uh, should come out. Um, she, uh, was on, uh, she was placed on sinitinib. She had a good response, but she's now died, I think. Uh, two years on from uh, her original treatment. And I think we just, uh, David gave a very nice talk on uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy this morning. Obviously, the trials are really important in this area. Um, without the trials, what, have, what has been our approach, like his, it's been to remove symptomatic kidneys. It has to be clear cell histology. You need a good performance status. No brain mets. I think cytoreductive nephrectomy doesn't help people with brain mets, and it's a point worth making. And I think, I think it probably only helps patients where the renal burden is a very large majority of the total burden, doesn't it? And I think not uh, in rapidly progressive disease. But Tim, I, think I, I sometimes prescribe a trial of life, we call it, in these patients and just see what happens in two to four months and it can be quite revealing on which course they're going to follow. Yeah, Did you nice think point. it was surgically possible to take that out? No, no, no I don't think so. I mean, I think you could remove the kidney. And the nose. But I don't think the nodes are removable, are they? They're wrapped around. Uh, I don't think a lymphadenectomy there was feasible. I don't think that's anatomically removable anatomy of well, lymph nodes. Tim, if you just go back, it, it exemplifies David Smith's point made very well earlier on, which is the difficulty of controlling the, the renal hilum in a case yeah. like that because you won't be able to get it in the interaortic cable space uh, or to the, uh, to the right of the cava yeah, no, with I, any I, ease. I, I think the site reduction of is more difficult than the cable surgery. <laughs> Uh, I think they're some of the most difficult nephrectomies of all, actually, and uh, I think it would have been madness to go to cytoreductive nephrectomy in that lady. Uh, I think it could have been uh, not a good surgical outcome at all. Good. Okay. So, case 4A, I wish, is Steve Cannon still here or not? Well, thank goodness for that. <laughs> right. Case 4A, um, a retired sports teacher sailing in the Dominican Republic and presents with right arm pain as he's, we as he's wheeling the sails in on uh, a boat. And uh, again, superb performance status, fit as a butcher's dog. And um, 
This is uh, one of the great CTs, isn't it? There's his um, arm in a cast. But you can see the fracture in his right humerus. And um, it's been pinned <laughs> or nailed. <laughs> I think Steve said that wasn't allowed, didn't he, this morning? Uh, I don't know. I asked him over coffee whether pathological fractures should ever be nailed. And he said, well, you can nail them, but they don't heal. Uh, and it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, uh, he was pretty, pretty categorical about that, wasn't he? Well, I think his arm's quietened down quite a bit, hasn't it? But reasonable. Maybe we've, maybe we've learned from that. So I must say, I thought it was a very good talk by uh, Steve this morning. So this is a guy presenting uh, with renal cell cancer uh, with a metastasis to the right humerus and um, also uh, a metastasis to the pelvis as well. And the question is, uh, what should you do at that point? Should the patient have a nephrectomy? Uh, he has a pelvic bone metastasis, a right humeral metastasis, and there's a big lump in the kidney. And there's the scan from January 2011. Well, he um, went into, um, uh, well, in fact, I suppose you'd say go into the trial. But say there wasn't the trial. What would be your criteria for removing the kidney there, Mike? Technical feasibility. Technical feasibility, which looks technically removable, doesn't yeah. it? And I think, we, I think our approach has been, before, before the trial, our approach has been if there's been a single site of metastasis or I'm not sure we'd do nephrectomies in the context of high-volume metastasis, probably. No, were you about to? Well, I agree. I think you know, high-volume bone metastases, is, they, they don't do very well mm. uh, generally. And uh, so if we can avoid um, overly intervening in this group of patients, then we would. One of the questions I would have in this particular case, he's, he's calcium 3.2. Mm. So the question is whether that's arising from the lytic aspect of his bone disease mm. or whether he's a, a, um, a, a parathyroid hormone-like secretor. Yeah. Um, and whether that, you know, getting that under control will facilitate his management further down the line. So I guess we will put him in the MDT and we discuss these cases. Uh, yeah. uh, how, does one make, how does one decide whether the calcium is being driven by the bones or the tumour? Because that would be a very important... Uh, well, you uh, can't. That's the bottom line. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or put them on... You put, you put him on drugs, didn't you? And the, the calcium came down. Anyway, he went into uh, Tom and uh, Simon's study... Uh, of uh, pazopanib and it's interesting we've had a discussion on how you assess response and there are the two uh, CTs um, five months apart and uh, they'd be reassuring if you were a patient I think that uh, your tumour was really biting uh, on this drug it's uh, amazing uh, amazingly impressive response to a drug isn't it one a real corker so we then uh, we then uh, but interestingly um, Interesting, there's the, uh, there's the uh, well, my arrows haven't moved, there's the metastasis in the left uh, pelvic bone. That doesn't seem to have responded. Uh, the arrows are in the wrong place, but you can see the lump uh, in the uh, pelvic bone. That doesn't seem to have... Is that a common thing, that the primary is changing dramatically, and yet the bone lesion in the pelvis doesn't appear to have changed much at all? Tom? Uh, is that the responses in different organs change mm. depending on the organ. So response in the bone are very difficult to measure due to the nature of bone. Um, but responses in the bone are less frequent. Responses in the lung are higher. Responses in the kidney are actually only 6%, whereas lung response rates 50%. This yeah. guy's obviously had a form of response. Yeah. But this guy doesn't hit a, a resist response because he's not had a 30% reduction. Yes, the tumour looks completely different, but if you measure it, it's only going to be a 20% reduction. Yeah. So actually, he's got stable disease. Yeah, interesting. Shrini. That's the same question I have, because resist criteria is primarily for chemotherapy. For TKI, is the response, can you apply the same resist criteria, or the criteria has no, to be different? No, I don't think we can, can we? Anyway, he did have a nephrectomy, uh, and the nephrectomy, uh, um, the nephrectomy showed almost complete necrosis, didn't it, in the tumor? There was virtually no live tumor in the uh, specimen. He made a very rapid recovery from that and continues to uh, tick along on treatment. So he's case 4A. So you won't be surprised to know there's a case 4B. So what are you going to do with this bone? His bones haven't changed. Why not do something with his bones? Uh, good question. Um, Dr. Chowdhury, why aren't we doing anything with his bones? Uh, we are Should we send him to Steve Cannon, have some bone surgery? 
I must admit, we might send him to Steve Cannon. He's got a lesion in his left acetabulum, uh, left, left acetabular roof, so he's having a, an orthopaedic opinion for that at the moment. Um, uh, I think in the next couple of weeks to see what they think with regards to that. I mean, it, it is tempting now that the, the kidneys come out, the bone is the solitary site of disease for him. Two he's, well, he's got, he's got, he's got two, the right yeah. forearm still. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think... One no, I think we're thinking about being quite aggressive about his bone now. I think he's had that period, as you say, that trial on drug where he's done well, where the kidneys come out. He's obviously shown himself to be a responder. The calcium's controlled. He's kind of in a different category now. So I think he's going to see an orthopaedic surgeon with regards to that. I think we may revisit his arm after the, the talk today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, case 4B, um, just to uh, uh, illustrate the problems of this type of approach... This is a lady who staggered into the clinic at Guy's in December 2010. She heavy smoker, problematic lung metastases, uh, really struggling with a big uh, uh, right-sided kidney tumor. She also went on to pazopanib and also had an absolutely brilliant response. I have to say, I do think it's a fantastic drug. And the surgery is not, di not difficult. I, there's a lot of talk about the surgery being incredibly difficult after TKIs. After this drug, I found the surgery to be very straightforward. I don't know whether that's your experience, John. Is that? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think the surgery after pisoponib is uh, <coughs> uh, not, not made more difficult, probably made easier. Anyway, she also uh, went forward uh, for a nephrectomy. It was probably one of the easiest nephrectomies I've ever done, and she died. And uh, she spent three months on intensive care. And, uh, she, you know, we, we, she was better than she was and we did a straightforward nephrectomy with no bleeding, but she didn't have any reserve. She got a complication, and it just went ugly. And uh, it just went ugly. And I think this is why there's the trial of the drugs plus surgery versus the drugs alone, isn't there? Sorry? Well, I think, no, I think this, is a very, this lady illustrates very well why there is the... Um, Carmina trial, doesn't it? Because actually you can take the kidney out in some people and just stuff happens. You know, she had a, she had a very straightforward nephrectomy and then just, it just didn't go well <laughs> and she died. And it was not a good outcome. And, uh, Tim, uh, I think it's important to remember that, that in undertaking major abdominal surgery, in a group of patients who've got significant comorbidity, as she has, she's probably ASA three or four from what you say with her chest, her mortality from the surgery alone, leaving aside anything else, is of the order of 5% five, five at least. Yeah. So you can expect stuff like this. Yeah, no, well, I, I think that's right. And I think she, her, she, her ECOG status did improve dramatically on the drug. She really improved. She was no way she was a candidate for surgery when she presented. She really did improve. But sometimes surgery is still a major stress and challenge to patients, even if it goes smoothly. And in the end, it, uh, you know, she ended up with a complication from which she couldn't recover. Anyway, you did it lap, I guess? Um, she didn't have it done lap. No, these patients, uh, because of the issues about whether the dissection is straightforward in these cases, she had it done open. But I think we probably ought to do some of these nephrectomies lap. Can I move on to the next case? Yeah. This is a very nice case, and we'll finish with this case. Um, a 60-year-old man, he was having a CT for coarctation of the aorta. Um, unusual uh, situation that someone's having a CT for coarctation of the aorta. Um, but that's the finding on the CT for coarctation of the aorta um, of a right renal mass. Um, the coarctation wasn't felt to be uh, hemodynamically compromising, so the recommendation was that he ought to have that right um, renal cancer removed. But clearly, you know, a challenging, a challenging right-sided nephrectomy, but uh, one that uh, looks perfectly reasonable to do and there's no sign of uh, uh, metastasis at presentation. A big tumor, uh, invasion outside the kidney, but no sign of venous invasion, uh, no lymph nodes seen in the specimen, and all margins were clear. So, um, interesting talk from Tim Whittleston this morning. Um, would you have done a formal, full lymphadenectomy um, for that case, Mike? Yes, uh, in short. And uh, let me just turn to my page here for a sec because I, I was interested in Tim's presentation. I don't know if he's still here. 
The, the problem we have with these lymphadenectomies is we really don't know what the regional lymphatics are for the right or the left kidney. So I tend to do what I call ipsilateral, but on the right I would go to the aorta, if not uh, even a little bit around the aorta. So I would always do, but that, you know, my bias is in the absence of evidence in kidney cancer. And by the way, I don't think the ERTC study reported almost 20 years ago as good evidence because the limits of the lymphadenectomy was not defined uh, in that study. Would you uh, do so I would I say in the absence of evidence in kidney cancer currently, I, as you can tell by my comments, I operate, I, I go maximal. Yeah. yeah. Well, he has necrosis and he has a big tumor. He didn't have visible hematuria. And what was the fourth criteria? I can't remember. 10 centimeters. Uh, 10 centimeters. So he's got three of the four. Uh, Noel, would you do a full lymphadenectomy, formal RPLND type lymphadenectomy for that case at presentation? Well, it's an interesting, you know, it's back to the fact and factoid, isn't it, really? Mm. Um, the first thing to say is the URTC study of this, uh, this which was uh, highlighted by Tim earlier on, um, most of those are relatively good prognosis, so yeah. the event rate in that study was very low. Uh, and as mentioned, the microscopic metastatic rate was low. So it's uninterpretable as a lymph node clearance study, in my view. And I think the authors of that study will recognize that. It took yeah. a long time to, re, uh, to, uh, to get to the point where it was reported, and there was a bit of missing data. So I don't think it's valid information in relation to, to answering this question. So in regard to this particular case, well, um, anybody who does this kind of surgery regularly knows that uh, you, the best way to do it is to get right onto the vessels, move the vessels out of the way, and clear out everything alongside and behind. So in fact, during the course of an operation on this, you would remove all of that tissue pretty much because the, uh, the cave is rolled across as well. So you'd remove all of that tissue back down onto the anterior spinous ligament pretty much. So you've, you've done more or less an interaortic cable and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, right paracaval uh, lymphadenectomy in doing the procedure. Well, I agree with that. And I, I must say, you, you do these, op you know, one does these operations, and I completely agree. You need to skeletonize the vein in order to do that operation properly. So you get a path report where saying no lymph nodes seen in the specimen. You think, oh, can that really be the case? Anyway, um, there's the scan six months later. Um, who wants to have a look at that one? Uh, uh, well, why don't you all have a look at that one? And uh, you can see that there's an incredibly vascular uh, metastasis in the uh, right paracaval uh, um, area. Um, so, Robert, what would, uh, what would you recommend for that? Six months after an unpleasant uh, clear cell, big radical nephrectomy with clear evidence, radiological evidence of very vascular um, metastasis there. Nothing else at all? Obviously, good point. No sign of systemic metastasis. Pulmonary bone. So it's quite a, a short time after mm. surgery to consider whether you would attempt to remove that. That would be the question. Is it surgically resectable, or do you go for uh, systemic therapy or observation? And that was clearly our decision. You know, should this guy have a difficult... Uh, paracaval lymphadenectomy six months on with possible cable replacement that is going to be fairly sticky or should we go with up front and this, I think we face this decision a lot don't we with low volume recurrence how do you make a decision about whether to go with surgery to resect it or to use systemic treatment to try and treat it I mean our approach has been that if we think there's a single site and it's clearable with surgery then we go for surgery uh, but if there's multi-site, then we use systemic treatment. That's been our approach. Is that your approach in the Christie? Or? It, it yeah. is generally. Y yes, it is. The, the concern is that the short period of time. It, exactly. No, I, the, the, time to, the time to recurrence here is seriously pacey, isn't it? it? The problem, though, is that you don't, you probably haven't imaged this patient in the six months. I, I mean, can't remember. He, yeah. he, to be honest, he, he, I can't remember whether he had a scan at three months or not. So I but odds are he didn't, I would guess. I don't know what your practice is. But this for high risk, for high risk uh, renal cancer, we tend to scan three monthly in the first mm -hmm. year because I think re renal cancer that recurs, I think, tends to recur quickly, doesn't it? Because but that, to me, is the key question. If it had been anybody but you, Tim, I would have thought this is a lymph node mass that hadn't been removed, particularly I with the path report. I think it is a lymph report. node mass that hasn't been removed. Yeah but it was perhaps part of the original index. It wasn't there lesion. on the original imaging. Well, just go back. There was disease behind the cava. 
you know, we're not seeing all the cuts, but you know, it's clearly displaced in the cave. So, um, usually we see these cases later on, right? And if the longer the interval, the more aggressive I right. think all okay. of us would be okay. operating. Good point. Anyway, what did we? There's the there's the mass that we've got to deal with. We've talked about what we'd recommend. We recommended surgery, and. Uh, I thought cable replacement might well be required here. So we did this case at King's College with the, uh, the hepatobiliary liver transplant surgeons. Uh, and cable replacement we did feel was required in order to get proper surgical clearance. And you can see the, uh, the cable graph there. Um, but I think we did get good surgical clearance. And it was um, uh, uh, clear, metastatic clear cell cancer in nodes. So I don't think he'd had. Um, I don't think he'd had the best quality surgery originally. Uh, I think he had a good quality operation the second time, but I don't think he had a good enough operation probably the first time. But uh, whether that means you should do it for everybody, of course, uh, is another question. Um, so 18 months on, uh, there's a metastasis in the lung. So what do you do now? He's already had some paracaval, lymph node met, six months. He's now 18 months on. But it still looks like another isolated met. Do you go to systemic treatment now, James, or would you send him over to the Brompton to have that uh, removed? So that's solitary site, isn't it? That yeah, stuff at the left yeah, base we, is nothing. Yeah, you, I'm asking you. Uh, obviously, I can't show you all the images, but uh, we, we think that's a solitary one. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily rush, and I would, uh, yeah, I would ask the question, are there any other local therapy modalities that could be considered? I mean, it's an asymptomatic small MET. But um, easy to do that with that, I think, peripherally placed, isn't it? Uh, I think that's a reasonable thing to do as well. I'm not, you know, I think yeah. that both approaches are yeah. reasonable ones. I'm not sure I okay. feel there's a st strong argument. Tricky. I, I think these recurrent tumours are, are tricky uh, and knowing what to do. I think sometimes in MDM, if MDMs serve any role at all, I think it's sometimes to help with these difficult recurrence tumours rather than the primaries. So what we might do, Tim, is we might repeat the scan in a couple of months' time, and if suddenly there are five or six lymph nodes, yeah. or five or six lung mets, we know that surgery would have been the wrong thing to do. But in, in two months' time, that's still the only li li site of disease. Yeah. We would probably go down a surgery route. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, he did have a <coughs> surgery. A thoracotomy was done. In fact, there were two sites of metastasis uh, uh, identified, and they both had clear cell cancer in. So the question I have uh, for the oncologist at this point is, we've now had recurrence in the lymph nodes, we've now had recurrence in the lungs. Would you use systemic treatment now? Is this, this is stage four NED, though, effectively. No valuable yeah, disease yeah, accepted. No answer, answer, answer no. No. Not in the abs outside of clinical trial. Okay. But, but it would be good to have a trial that included yeah. these patients. Yeah. So he, he, he's had observation. Um, and at 30 months now following the surgery, he's got that, um, which is an unpleasant symptomatic metastasis uh, um, in the uh, paraspinal uh, muscles. So for that, he, um, he has gone on sinitidib. He's developed skin toxicity, problematic hypertension, which is needed managing, although that's, that's a, a good thing in sinitidib, isn't it, if you've got problematic <laughs> hypertension. This is something I ask Simon a lot, is that, you know, if, if hypertension is a good indicator of response, you don't want to take the patient off the drug for the hypertension, do you, because they're responding well. So how do you control hypertension induced by sunitinib? You use as many pills as is necessary. You and just you keep loading the pills, yeah, but just, keep them on and the if, drug. If, 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 you need if, if you need help, then you ask someone who's good at hypertension, like a renal physician right, or a cardiologist. Right, but don't take them off the drug. Sorry? Well, obviously, you know, if they've got malignant <laughs> hypertension and they're in casualty, yes. But, I mean, you, you, it, I regard it as a failure if you, if you have to stop for hypertension. But it is a very good, it, it is a very good correlative response, yes, isn't yes it? Yes, it is, and there's a trial going on right now where you give a drug called axitinib and you ramp up the dose until you develop hypertension. Yeah. And that's comparing the standard dose axitinib. And the key to that is we're looking at hypertension and trying to precipitate hypertension. The key is whether you should treat it aggressively or not. And we... In the trial, it has been treated aggressively, and it's still associated with the benefit. So, yes, we should treat it aggressively, but it may be an important biomarker. Right. Sure, Mike. We found that contrast-enhanced ultrasound is done at two weeks after starting sunitinib. It can be quite informative, and we might actually RFA that lesion if we found a good drop in the blood supply. It, it works quite well. Interesting. 
Oh, well, that's interesting. We haven't, we haven't used local treatment on that. I think, I think I've got the correct slices here, but uh, I think it's had a pretty good response, uh, objective response on the imaging to... Uh, two or three to yeah, it's big. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, big. Uh, yeah. No, I think it probably would be quite good for RFA. Right. I think that's enough.